Well, good morning, everybody. Might as well stand up, jump around. At least you warm up a little bit. Even though this is my kind of weather, you guys will be able to worship God today because I heard it's going to be 52 sometime this week. So, yeah, you know, thank you, your pastor, crying. <laughs> well, let's give him glory today. Hallelujah! To the world outside, we see darkness growing. We are outnumbered, we are surrounded, darkness growing. But when you look at the fear in our eyes, we see those with us all. We have the victory, we have the courage, the battle. of God I know sometimes it's you may feel that uh, you know the Lord may, may he's not answering what you need he's not helping you but, um, you know I know in my experiences that you know every time I thought that and I stayed in faith that that's the time when he was working the most and just stay with them and, you know God can take you places that you can't achieve on your own. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23. 
Psalm 27, 13. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is the goodness of God.
Thank you for fathering us. From Revelation 4, a throne was standing in heaven, and someone was sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out of the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second creature like a calf, the third creature had the face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, 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 is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and is and who is to come. give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory 
and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will, they exist and were created. lovely and that scene that we read about we heard about in the book of Revelation we'll be partakers of that we'll be observers of that and by your spirit you'll remind us of this day that we heard that very thing and now here we are in the heavenly of heavens standing before you just worshiping you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your incredible love toward us, your great mercy and compassion. We worship you, Lord. We magnify you in this place. 
We ask that you would refresh us, Lord, by your spirit. We ask that you would bring to remembrance the things that you've spoken to us. That we could draw near to you. We just want to tell you that we love you. We honor you in this place. Now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We'll greet one another and you may be seated. Good morning, Community Life Church. Welcome, everybody. Yes, yes, yes. My name is Jason, and I just wanted to welcome you this morning and tell you, happy Sunday. Yes. <laughs> if, uh, if you're watching online, welcome to you as well. Those that are watching on Facebook and YouTube, make sure you like, subscribe, share, and get this message out so that more and more people can hear the Word of God. Amen? Yes. Yes. Here at Community Life Church, we are on a mission to help people to know God, find purpose, and experience life. And we are not giving up on that mission. Because we want more and more people to know who God is. Amen? Yeah. And we want more people to experience true life in Him. Um, if this is your first time with us, welcome. You are our guest, and we're glad to have you here today. If you would look in the seat uh, in front of you, you'll see a card. It looks just like the picture on the screen up there. If you grab that card, fill out those few uh, lines on that, and drop it in the back. That way we can connect with you and let you know what's going on. Also, uh, if you check out our, our uh, website there, you can, you can download the, the church app. Uh, where you can find out more information, that's at clcbutler.org slash events. You can download that app, and this is how you can find out uh, other ways to get connected, to know what's going on. If, also, if you leave your uh, your uh, notifications on, we can let you know if for some reason we have to be closed for inclement weather or anything like that. So uh, just want to make sure you, you get connected with us so that we can tell you what's going on. This is the, the part of the service where we receive our tithes and offerings. And we have several ways of doing that now. Electronically, you can do it with uh, online. You can do it with the app itself. You can text to give, or there's also an envelope in the seat in front of you as well. You can put cash or check in there, and there's a box in the back that you can drop that in. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about how our God provides for us. And, and the last several weeks, I've been reading through the book of Exodus. And if you read the history of, of Israel and see all the ways that God provided for his people, it really is amazing. Before they left Egypt, God instructed them to go to their masters, for because the, they were slaves, right? And he said, hey, um, give us some gold and silver and stuff. And they're like, okay, here you go. Their masters gave them their gold and silver before they left Israel, I mean Egypt. That doesn't happen, people. <laughs> you don't just go and say, hey, give me some gold. And okay, here, sure. But they did, because God had directed them to do so. So then they go out in the, in, in the wilderness, right? And it's only a few days before they're like, hey, uh, we're getting thirsty here, and we don't have any water. And God tells Moses, hey, go, uh, you know, hit that rock over there and watch what happens. So he hits a rock, and water just starts pouring out, and they all have water to drink. And it's like, okay, that's pretty cool, right? So then they're hungry, and this, this stuff comes out of, the, out of the sky, manna, that they're able to eat. And then they still start complaining a little more, saying, we like some meat with this. And so all of a sudden, a big flock of quail just comes and lands on the, on the, on the wilderness ground. And they're like, oh, cool, quail. Just picks up. I mean, God provide, provided for them in just no way to say it, but miraculous ways. Yeah. Stuff that they could not do on their own. But it did require something of them. And that was that they had to first step out in faith. Because they had to leave what they had in Egypt in order to follow the promise that God had for them 
in order for God to then be able to provide in miraculous ways. So what in the world does that have to do with us today? Well, God's calling all of us to step out in faith, to be obedient to him and his word. And his word tells us that we're to give. Matter of fact, it gives kind of a formula throughout from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It gives us a, a basis, and the basis is a tithe, which is 10%. God says, if you'll give me 10% of everything that, that you have coming in, I will bless your house, and I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. Actually, in the Old Testament, they, they were commanded to give not only a tithe, but offerings and stuff above that. So the tithe is only the, the starting point. But every time they did this and every time they obeyed, God provided for them miraculously. And I just believe that God is faithful and that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so if he was able to give to them, he can give to us the same way. If we're faithful to give to him like he asked us to, then he will provide for us and take care of our needs. And we have scriptural basis to back this up. I could sit here for an hour and a half and quote scriptures about this and tell you about it, but I don't have time to do that, so I'm not going to. But, <laughs> but I promise you that if you will give God the opportunity and say, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient to you and your word, he will provide for you in all kinds of ways. So, uh, Lord, I thank you that we have the ability to gain wealth. Your word tells us that you give us the ability to, to, to create wealth. And thank you for that. Thank you, Lord, that you give us strength to be able to work and to be able to do, to be able to to provide for our families. And I just pray, Lord, a blessing upon everybody here and everybody that gives today, Lord God. I pray that you would give back to them miraculously, Lord God, that you would provide, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing as your word talks about. I pray, Lord, that you'd use the income that comes in to, to reach this community for you, but to reach out beyond this community, that people all over the world would come to know the knowledge of you, to come to truth and, and come to experience the life that we've experienced in you. We thank you, Lord, for, for every blessing that's ours. And we give to you now, thanking you and, and giving you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So uh, we are still looking for volunteers to join Team Life, especially in the area of, of housekeeping. So if you're able to help us out even once a week, once a month, whatever it may be, just an hour or two here or there, that you can help to uh, sweep some floors, empty some garbage cans, things like that. We need some help in that area. So if this is an area that you can help us with, please make sure you sign up for that. Uh, any help would be appreciated. Also, I want to remind you that we are collecting donations for the rummage sale now. Uh, the rummage sale still a ways off. But we want you to start thinking about it now because we know that as you start cleaning stuff up, you're going to want to start getting rid of stuff. And we want you to bring it here so we can uh, have that. We always like to have a really nice rummage sale because the nicer it is, the more people come, the more people come, the more people can hear about Jesus. It's that simple, right? Pretty, pretty simple. So uh, also want to remind you to come and join us for prayer meetings here at the building Tuesday morning, 1030 to 1130, Wednesday evening, 7 to 8. Um, we have prayer, and it is powerful. It is good stuff. And if you're not participating in it, I just want to encourage you, come check it out. You will, you will be blessed. Uh, there, it's just a powerful time where we come together in agreement. And, and the Bible says that where two or three come and gather and are agree, in, in agreement on anything, what, is, what does it say? It says the presence of God will be there in their midst, right? So as we come together praying, God's presence is here. And I can tell you it is a powerful time. Make sure you come be part of that. Um, how many people enjoy, came Friday night and enjoyed the uh, movie night and potluck? Yeah. Most of the hands in this room, most people are here. So we're excited about it. We want to do it again. But it's not going to be this Friday. So... Uh, keep an eye on the, on the calendar. We will let you know when it's going to happen. We've got to get the schedule in order, make sure that we have everything uh, lined up for that. So um, I know Pastor Steve was excited and said, hey, we want to invite you all back this Friday, but it's not going to be this Friday. So <laughs> don't show up this Friday, but we will let you know as soon as we get that on the schedule because we do want to do it again. And it, 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 it was a, a good time, right? I know I had a good time. Yeah. Ate a lot of food and really enjoyed it. Yeah. And I want to do it again. So <laughs> anyway... Pastor Stephen, maybe come share the word of God with us today. I gotta put my Bible down here. Good morning. How are you on this freezing cold morning? Everybody's still frozen. Silence. <laughs> I like it. Uh, it's going to warm up though when you look at the week. Spring is hinting. Hinting at the door there. <clears throat> well, uh, did you come this morning expecting to hear from the Holy Spirit? Yes. Expecting to hear from God? Yes. I just want to remind you, you do have to expect that by faith when you 
you know, come in to listen to a message, open up your heart. The Holy Spirit has something to say to you this morning. So let's just begin by prayer. Father, we just are thankful for, uh, we're thankful for our, your love for us. We're thankful for this church. We thank you for this fellowship. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, mm. that you love us, you're for us, that you dwell in believers, Lord. And we're here, Holy Spirit, to hear from you. I, I pray, Father, that people don't hear Pastor Steve or myself so much as they're hearing your voice, Holy Spirit. Speak to them through this message. Help us to grow. Help us to understand you. Help us to draw closer to yes. you, to become more like you. And we just say we love you. We expect good things. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So we are continuing in this uh, series of messages. Well, we actually turned it into a couple of messages. Come on. God's uh, relationship, God's way. And, uh, you know, except for knowing Jesus and experiencing eternal life and having a relationship with God, you know, the God who created the heavens and the earth, healthy relationships with people, I think, especially the body of Christ, make life so much more enjoyable, do they not? I mean, good, healthy relationships, there's just nothing, they're so life-giving, getting along with one another, you know, learning to work together with one another, laugh together, cry together, mm -hmm. uh, just growing up spiritually together, praying together, just enjoying our company together is so life-giving. It, and even living on mission for Christ, that's really what we're about here, too. It isn't just fellowship, but our fellowship unites us around the mission of Christ, which is to tell people the good news of the gospel. Come on. And so our relationships are meant to be a source of joy and strength in our lives, but I think we can all attest to the fact that that can be really hard sometimes, right? Because it takes effort. It takes effort it takes a big dose of humility and yeah. willingness of our heart to get along with people, to do the emotional work of hanging in there and going, I'm not going to quit. That's right. This is going to work out if we do it God's way. We talked about this last week, these, this message. If you didn't hear last week's message, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. You know, as it'll make, it, it ties into very much of what we're saying today. Yes. Uh, but emotionally healthy relationships take effort and hard work. Anybody who's been married for any number of years could add a big amen to that. Amen? amen. Yeah, no, I guess all your marriages and relationships have just been so easy. Ours has been the only one that's been <laughs> difficult. I mean, we've been married 43 years. 47, 44 this year. 44, it'll be in September, yeah. And our marriage, I shared this, some of this last week, you know, it's gone through some difficult seasons, just like any relationship mm -hmm. does. Friendships go through difficult yeah. seasons, but marriages certainly do. And over the years, we can let things slip. This over-familiarity with each other, it's like, well, you know, you drop some of the respect, some of the honor, and before you know it, you're hurting each other's feelings, and you're keeping some things hidden, some wounds hidden, and Sometimes it's hard, you know, whenever you've let that go on for a while, you reach this place where you're tolerating a relationship, and you get to this whatever, we've gone mm. around this over and over again, do we have to go, you know, are we going to do this again? And I, some of what I shared last week, what we learned to do is we put Jesus over head of our marriage. Yeah. You grab hands and like stand, give God lordship over your home. And say, we're, if we do this God's way, God promises us abundant life. That's right. But we have to do it God's way. We cannot partake of God's abundant life unless we do it his way. And I can, if, I can tell you, if you are willing to do it God's way, he will pour out his mercy and grace on a broken relationship. Right. And, and it, bring life out of it. Right. It's not going to be simple or it's not going to be easy. And sometimes it's painful. Right. But yet, the, the, you know, the, you, it produces the peaceable fruit of righteousness. It does. And God intends for our homes, he intends for our homes, our families, to be a place where there is love and understanding, and it can be like a refuge from the world. And it's also meant to be a launching pad for us to go back out into the world. Yeah. I think there's nothing more beautiful than a family that's on mission together serving Christ. Husbands, wives, moms, dads, children. Yes. 
but that refuge from the world, that love and understanding in our home, it also is meant to be similarly yes. transposed into the church because the church uh, in scripture, people of God are called brothers and sisters in Christ, right? Yeah, that's right. So we are the family of God. So we're learning to get along with each other. <laughs> this is like the crucible for it. That's Put true. Put people together with all of our differences, all of our quirks, all of our just personality traits that are, that are different. And God says, I want you to all get along. <laughs> That's why we need the Spirit of God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I need you and you need me. That's how God's put this together. Yep. God's designed us to live in community, to live in relationship with one another. I mean, he's, God said at the beginning in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone, right? And I think about all this stuff with the COVID, the social distancing and the shutdowns and the stay-at-home orders and the masking, and there's been a lot mm -hmm. of isolation. And with it comes mental health problems. When you isolate too much, you have mental health problems, you, people have anxiety, depression, not just in adults, but in teenagers. Right. We're seeing this in kids now. People have been too isolated, and you get kind of weird when you get too isolated. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Have you remember the movie Castaway? Anybody see that movie? When a volleyball becomes like a man's best friend? <laughs> Tom Hanks is It's pretty awesome. Is stranded on this <laughs> tropical uninhabited island. He's a he was a, on a FedEx plane with a lot of cargo and the plane goes down. He's the only survivor and he's just, you know, he's on shore. He's he's going through all the wreckage and these FedEx boxes are floating up to shore and he's ripping them open and he, as he's doing it, he cuts his hand and he's throwing things out, but he grabs a volleyball, one of it was a Wilson volleyball, and he throws it, you know, and then he looks at the volleyball and it's got this handprint of his hand on it in blood. And he gets this bright idea, he's like, I'm gonna put a face on it. He draws two eyes on it, a nose and a smiley face. And puts hair on. We it. got that. Show that picture, yeah. <laughs> and Wilson <laughs> becomes his. He, he calls him Wilson. Becomes his friend for four years while he's stranded on that island. The movie is pretty funny because he talks to it, banter's with it, has this conversation. He gets mad at it. <laughs> oh, you're offended at me. Well, I'm offended at you. And he he just goes through. I forgive you. And then at some point, after four years, he tries to make his way off that island. And he does, a desperate attempt. And he takes Wilson with him, and then Wilson bounces off this homemade raft that he, that he made and floats off into the ocean. The guy's like, panic, Wilson! You know, I'll save you! And he's running after him. <laughs> and just after watching that movie, I thought, this is just a perfect example of the human need mm -hmm. for relationships. Yep. But you go kind of crazy without a relationship with somebody. And I think, you know, with a volleyball, of course, but some of you might feel like I'm in a relationship with a volleyball. You know, they just sit there and stare at me, and they're like, no, oh, <laughs> not saying anything numb. <laughs> you know, you're like, talk to me. <laughs> you know, and some of you are like, I wish I had a volleyball. I wish you would be quiet and just look at me and smile and be agreeable with me, right? <laughs> 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 but God made us for relationships yeah. with one another, especially in the church. Really, a church family. Pastor Mamie yeah. made mention of it. How, how often in Scripture does it say that we are brothers and sisters in Christ? Yeah. You know, and it, we have to work at healthy relationships in the church because Scripture then declares that we are to be encouraged and spur us on to love and good works. But inside the church, you're going to find strife, disagreement. You're going to find backbiting. And the reason is, is because we all bring in baggage. We just have baggage. Every single one of us is baggage. It's magic from, yeah, yeah <laughs> emotional baggage. Emotional baggage. <laughs> but it was from, you, we bring stuff in from the world. You, if you watch TV, you're going to pick up something from the world. If you're in conversation with people, you're going to pick up something from the world. And then our family of origin. You know, there is not a single one of us that had a family of origin that did not have some kind of dysfunction in our emotions. 
Can we say amen to that? Amen. E except last week after we had, uh, after service in, ended, Matt comes up to us and, and says, well, I just want to let you know that I had the ideal family. And we, we said, oh. You did. <laughs> yes, and he says, yes. I deal with this, I deal with that, I deal with this, yeah. I deal with crazy. <laughs> oh my gosh. But what we have to do is, <laughs> we have to deal with crazy. We do. But we have to deal with crazy God's way. That's why it's necessary for us to read what Scripture says and then to apply what Scripture says into our relationships because God is all intended and His goal is that we do have healthy relationships. And that It's important that we look and try to improve our character. God wants us to walk in godly character. And of course, like Pastor Mamie mentioned here, this is the crucible of where that works. People come in and think the church is going to be an ideal place. It's, this isn't heaven. We're practicing. We're practicing. That means we're going to deal with issues. But we have to deal with issues God's way. Yeah. Because that's what's going to make healthy relationships. Yeah. And like Pastor Mavis says, it isn't easy. No, it's not. It isn't easy. It's Living with somebody like me is just... It's pure awesome, bliss. Honey. <laughs> you should have seen us Monday after we preached last oh. Sunday. It was just, it, God is just funny, you know. It's like we look at each other, it's like, we just preached about this. Now we have to walk this out again. <laughs> again. 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 But here we are together and again, smiling. And again. And yeah. Yes, but you but have we, to talk it out. You yeah. have to, you have to own what you yeah. what you're part of it you have to own it if you don't yeah. then you're it's unhealthy yeah. it's and ungodly you, and you talk about we say emotional baggage um right we tend to think when we become adults like somehow we leave our family physically and it's like well i'm done with that that whole experience mm. is over now life begins as a as an adult i'm grown up but we do have to recognize that some things ways of thinking that we picked up from our family environment, yeah. maybe from school, friends, people in authority around you. And we have some things that we learned, some things that were good and some things yeah. that were not right. so good. Right. Ways of thinking about ourselves, thinking about other people, people that are like us, people that aren't like us. What did, you, what did we learn how to deal with that? How did we learn to deal with conflicts, differences, offenses, rejection from people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think, sadly, many don't know how to handle when they leave. I think maybe that's why kids are staying home till they're 30 now. You know? <laughs> don't <laughs> let that don't, happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know how to handle what life and the devil throws at them. Right. We have to remember, this is not just a relationship, two people. There's two people, and then we say, oh, there's God involved. There is, but there's really four persons, if you consider, to call the devil a person, but... Because we are dealing with a fallen world and we are yep. dealing with an enemy who does want to deceive us and kill, steal, and destroy and mess up our relationships and divide us. I mean, how many times as a kid were you ever taught 1 Corinthians 13, which is the Bible calls the love chapter? We went over those verses last week. How many times did your parents ever say, we're just going to talk about this? Especially with your friends and when you have conflict with family members and here's how we solve it. I, I didn't. No, I, I went didn't. to church. You could go to church all your life but still go home and not live it out. And the sad part is I think most of the church does that. Mm -hmm. We forget. We hear, but the Bible says it's the doer of the word Come who's on. the blessed person. And so w you may have gone to church and you'd say, well, I grew up in a Christian home so it really wasn't that bad. But when you look inside the Christian homes, you still often find unforgiveness. You find people holding grudges. You find selfishness. You know, you find hatred even, right. which is awful, but you do find it. So like Pastor C was saying, as adults, we have to 
take a look a little bit about our family origin and go, what did I learn good and what maybe am I bringing into my relationships now that I'm not even aware of? Because some of this stuff can be blind spots. Correct. You know, it, it's hard to walk things out in love and like you said, grow in character. It's hard. It was hard as a kid and it's hard as an adult. Character building is not easy, is it? I just bought these set of books. I had to bring them with me and use it as an illustration. I just bought these set of books, and I don't know how many there are. They're from the 80s, Joy Berry. I wish I had had these to give to my kids and read to them because we, grew, we raised our kids in the 80s. Yep. But these are books <clears throat> on character building, how to be good. Help me be good is actually what it says. A book about being selfish, a book about complaining, <laughs> a book about being rude, a book about lying, about teasing, a book about cheating. <laughs> you get the point? All the things that kids go through, a book about being destructive, mm -hmm. stuff that we're supposed to grow out of. But sometimes I think, did we? A book about being careless, <laughs> <laughs> a book about being forgetful. I just forgot. I just, it's like, but you, maybe you always forget. A book about being mean. Hey, that's getting a little too close to home. <laughs> a book about being bossy. I mean, these are Give great. Give me that book. Yeah. <laughs> Here, a book about throwing tantrums. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the negative character traits that you want to tell your kids, like we want them to mature and grow out of, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's parents really do need all the help they can get. That's why I bought these. My prayer is that, I bought a set for each family, you know, the grandkids in each of the families, so that hopefully when they read it, because they're fun little stories, but they make the point. Right. It's like you don't really want to be this way. It's going to ruin your relationships with people, and here's how to be better. That's and right. <laughs> it's, well, here's the thing. The Bible has, it's amazing, this book of the Bible is really remarkable because the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church, and he tells them really, in a sense, you need these books. <laughs> yeah. it, it's going to come up on our uh, PowerPoint. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it starts off with, let me get a couple books to hand out here. I'm getting them ready. <laughs> it says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I've become a man, I'm done with childish ways and have put them aside. Throwing temper tantrums, being lazy, being bossy, being mean. We'll forget that one. <laughs> because it is about being forgetful. <laughs> but that's the key, is that God is expecting his people to grow up spiritually. Paul was with this church for three full years, teaching them the word of God. And what was amazing is that the Spirit of God was moving in the gifts of the Spirit at this church. And they were very confused. They were confused by thinking that, well, since the gifts of the Spirit are operating in this church, we must become, we must be spiritually pretty mature people. And we don't really need to worry about godly character because the gifts of the Spirit are manifesting here. You and I cannot equate, and the Bible does not equate, the gifts of the Spirit to becoming a spiritually mature individual. Spiritual gifting and character are completely two different things. A spiritual gift is just that, a spiritual gift. It's a gift. It, it takes, you just, it just happens. But now you take about godly character, that takes time. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Yeah, it, it means to crucify your flesh. It means not allowing your flesh to take dominance over your life. Not to say what you think. You know that's a good thing, not to say what you're thinking. But the better thing is to renew your mind so you're thinking the proper way. Mm -hmm. And that takes time. It takes effort. It takes energy. We want to say what God wants to say, right? Right? We want to act like God. We're to be conformed to His image. His image. We're to display the character of Christ. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. And it really comes down to the point where it means that we are saying no to the flesh, no to our carnal mind, 
and yes to the mind of the Spirit. The mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Don't you like that in your house? Yes. But it also declares very clearly that the mind of the flesh is death. Yeah. We don't want that. More moral character is work. It, it, you want to have, because if you're born again, the fruit of the Spirit's already dropped into your heart. It's already there. We want to walk in integrity. We want to have the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, humility, self-control. We want these things. This is how you determine who is spiritually mature and who is not. A gift of the Spirit just flows right through you. But to build godly character, it takes one choice after the other, after the other, after the other. That's the key. We don't want to just have the gifts of the Spirit and just start to think that I can live any way I want to. You could just be so anointed in a church service that great things are happening. People are getting delivered and set free, but you could be, uh, your private life could be messed up, completely messed up. You could be hard to get along with. You could, you could be easily offended. You could be so quick to defend yourself. You could be controlling your spouse. You know, when the flesh and the ego are unchecked, disaster's coming, folks. The Bible declares it. Families get torn apart, you, adultery, m mishandling money. You know, people's hearts get hurt, and people hold on to old wounds. They don't let them go. They don't talk them out. They don't recognize one another's hurt feelings and want to talk about it because it's, it's a sticky place to go. People come, become delusioned and walk away from Christ because unresolved issues. And all of it comes down to it gives Christ a, a bad name. It looks good. It looks bad on on Jesus. It's like we're giving Jesus a black eye ourselves because we don't deal with the issues at hand. I just recently heard a preacher, a minister, uh, who had been ministering at somebody's church, and uh, he said he he wasn't preaching, but he was sitting there, a mm -hmm. part of the service, and he said. The, the service was just awesome. It was anointed. There, were, there was a word of knowledge. There was beautiful worship. There was the minister of the church preached powerfully. He said, you know, it was just, you know, he laid hands on people. He said, then we went out to eat at a restaurant afterwards and sitting there at the restaurant after he ordered his meal, something fouled up with the meal. And he said, I couldn't believe it. He said that he started being so rude to the waitress over and over again about his meal that wasn't cooked mm. perfectly the way he wanted it. And he said, I just thought, wow, you know, this is how we do give Christ a bad name. Right. That on the one hand, you know, under the anointing, anybody can look good, if you know what I mean. Sometimes, you know, we put on our best, and if God is moving, everything seems perfect and good. But then you, it, the hard part is to walk the things out at home behind yes. closed doors or what happens like that when something goes wrong at your restaurant. And he was saying, what a character contradiction yes. this is. That ministry gifting and our knowledge of scripture, it's just like what Paul said at the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that even if I have faith to move mountains and I understand all mysteries, mm -hmm. and I even give all my money to the poor, but I don't have love, I'm like a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. And I think that's maybe what he felt like at the table with that minister. It was like, gong, gong, gong. <laughs> like, this doesn't fit the character of Christ. Right. And what would Jesus be pleased with? Because Paul did write yes. under the uh, influence of the Holy Spirit that faith, hope, and love abide. That's in chapter 13. But the greatest of these is what? Love. 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 And so Jesus wants anointing. He wants us to use our gifts. He wants us to serve. Come on. But he also wants us to have good character. And that's what the apostles looked for when they uh, were going to give up the 12 apostles, the distribution of food to the widows. Right. And they wanted to spend more time in prayer and the word. But it's, look at what it says. I think we're yeah, going to read that it's, scripture. It's Acts chapter 6, and it's a good... 
uh, scene being set there is that they didn't want to be waiting on the tables themselves. They needed to be the ones who are studying the Word of God so that they can teach the people. And so this is how he went about doing it. This is in verse 3. He's, Peter is just telling these, the people, there says, Therefore select out from among yourselves, brethren, seven men of good and attested character and repute, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who may be, who we could assign to look after this business and this duty. They're looking for men of good character, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. It wasn't either or. Can you do this task? That wasn't good enough. Can you do this task the right way? Yeah. Can you, do you have good character? And listen, our character is what we're going to take into eternity. You're not going to go up there and show God a list of things that you've done. He is going to actually look into your eyes and see if he can see himself. Mm. It's a whole lot easier to operate in the gift of the Spirit, isn't it? Which does make you feel like you're spiritually mature. But crucifying the flesh is what God is after. He's looking for our godly character. He's looking for integrity within us. He's, he, what we're going to take is our love toward God and the works we did in love for God. He's not looking, did you cross all the T's and dot all the I's? He's looking for godly character, and he's looking for abilities. Yeah. And loving people. I mean, that's the Looking greatest. for both. Yeah. You've got to have both. Love, our, loving God and loving people, that's our that's, great commandment. That is the great commandment. Praise God. We've got to understand that God is going deeper within us. And two-thirds of the New Testament... Like when you look at the epistles, when you read the, the epistles in the New Testament, the letters to the churches, it's written very much about character. Oh, yeah. When you start to just think about it as you're reading, examining our character in light of who we are called to be in Christ and our need to grow up spiritually. I mean, the Apostle Paul wrote a lot about this when he wrote letters to the churches. And the Corinthian church had... A lot of spiritual gifts in operation. And so, like Pastor Steve's been saying, you could sometimes equate that with, wow, these people really know God, and they're really mature. But, but when you start reading what Paul wrote to them, that really wasn't the case in their character. I mean, right. they got drunk at the communion table, not waiting for other people to come. <laughs> not a good idea. Yeah. In chapter 5, he deals with sexual immorality that was in the church, that the people in the church were just ignoring. And Paul, the apostle Paul, was a spiritual father to them. Right. So he established the church in Corinth and discipled them, you know, taught them about faith and obeying the word of God so a right foundation was built. So when he would go back to the church, he's kind of, and see, how's everybody doing? Are people growing? Are we growing up in Christ? And... Here's what he said here, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, Ooh. is what he discovered. This is a rebuke. He said, but I, brothers, and you could say sisters there, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Now, this was three years. This is the other interesting right. thing. This was like about three years after he had first established the church, and he goes back on you know, a missionary journey to see them, and then he writes this letter so in Paul's mind, after three years, people would be getting, getting it. Yes. He establishes the church, and, but he says this, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you're not ready yet, for you are still of the flesh. Mm. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way, like mere unchanged men. Wow. The Amplified puts it that way. Paul is basically saying, y'all are still quarreling just like babies, acting like kids. And I, I, you know, I think Paul would be like, come on over here, y'all need to read some of these books. You know, take a book on throwing tantrums <laughs> and getting along and not being rude to each other. 
but he emphasized, you know, the Apostle Paul continually emphasized who we are in Christ in his letters. And then right. the expectation was, you're not a mere human anymore. Don't act when like we, that. When we come to Christ, we've become a new creation. We've been given a new nature from God. One of my favorite scriptures is 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. This is the one that really caught me as I was growing in Christ at the very beginning. It says here, there, if any person is engrafted in Christ, he is a new creation. It says a new creature altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. Are you a new creation in Christ? Yes, yes. Well, then Paul's speaking to us. If we're truly born again, that means you and I have a new nature. Old things pass away. The, the Bible declares that you've actually died to that kind of behavior. You've died to it. You've died to it. The big problem with the church is that we don't have our minds renewed to find out yeah. who are we in Christ. For years we've handed out a little booklet by brother, written by Brother Hagin. It, there's 140. Three, I think it was right around 140, 143 places in the Bible. It says, in him, in whom, these are who you are in Christ. That's your new identity. If you're a new creation in Christ, wouldn't it behoove you if, to find out who you really are? Amen. Because what happens is the church, are, you're not even acting like who you are. You don't even know who you really, what was that, uh, Lion King. Lion King. <laughs> Thank you. You don't even know who you are. <laughs> and it's the truth. Most Christians don't even know who you are. You've been raised up and made to sit with Christ in heavenly places. You are perfectly united with Him. You are one with Him. You have the fruit of the Spirit within you. You have the ability to do all of this. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then it goes, not in your own strength. Yeah. See, we've got to understand, it's not pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. It's yielding your heart to the grace of God. Finding out who you are. You can't act like a new creation if you don't even know anything about the new creation. You're guessing. But this is what God is doing in our relationships. This tells you exactly what He's trying to do in our relationships. He wants you to walk away from that old childish stuff. Walk away from it. It's not even part of who you are. And the devil, that's his game. Bring this up. Didn't you get hurt over there? What is she talking about? Your mom and dad, they're so hard. <laughs> that's the key. Who are you in Christ? If you don't know, you're behind the eight ball. The devil has you played. Don't you hate it when you get played by the devil? Well, here's the key. If somebody's stealing from you, what are you going to do? You're going to stop them. The key is the devil's been stealing from us all the time. And how do we stop him? By actually not just knowing who we are in Christ, living it out. You start pushing him off your territory. You start to put on the new self you take off the old self and you put on the new self. Because if you start doing that, your responses are going to change. Mm -hmm. Your perception about everybody, people, things, it's going to change. It'll change. You'll start to act like you belong in heaven. That's what I want. Everything will change. We just have to become more like Christ. Everybody likes it, you know, hey, be patient with me. You know, give me a break. But are you giving the patience? Everybody, I want, to see, I want to receive mercy. Give me mercy. Are you giving mercy? Or are you judging? Which is, which is, which is what God wants us to do. 
And Jesus has given us all mercy that's beyond what we can even imagine. And, and if we have the mind of Christ, which the Bible declares we do, and how you get the mind of Christ is by reading the Bible, applying it in your daily life, this is how you do it. There's, there's, no, there's no shortcut. You're not going to get hands laid on you and then all of a sudden now my mind's renewed. Yeah. It takes work. I wish it would happen that way, but it doesn't. <laughs> but with all the tools that we have right now, because of the internet and all this, how quick it is to find a scripture that we need to have. Everybody likes to have their own way. But the Bible declares <laughs> there's a way of, within man who th thinks it's right, but it ends in death. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is yield our hearts over to the Spirit of God and walk in what He has. We have to feed on the Word of God. Yeah. We have to feed on it. That's what builds our faith. That's what renews our minds so that we can start to walk in the things of God. And if you don't know, then you start making it up. Oh, this is easy, so this must be right. Yeah. Oh, I remember somebody told me, let the peace of God be an umpire. Well, I have peace about this. I don't have to deal with it. <laughs> no, 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 no. See what's happening? If you don't know what it says, then what's going to happen is man is going to take the easiest path there is. Yeah. I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah. I'm okay, you're okay. Yeah. But the problem with that... It sounds good. It might feel good for a while, but the problem yeah. is God called us to a narrow path. Not everything is okay. On this path. On our path. That's if you really are a Christian, if you're born of the Spirit of God, you don't actually own your life anymore. That's the truth of Scripture. Yes. And I think sometimes the church just doesn't get it because we are not our own. Right. It's really not what I want or what he wants. It's really what Jesus Amen. wants. Amen. <laughs> and when we all look at it that way, it gets a little bit easier, I think, to lay down our preferences, our opinions, our, our, some of the, our strong feelings and go, the Lord will give us grace if we want to do it his way. But it does say this, Matthew 7, 13, mm -hmm. enter, this is Jesus talking, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. There you go. And those who enter by it are many. Verse 14, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard. Look what he says. It's hard. <laughs> it will be hard to choose right, choose integrity, choose faithfulness, choose forgiveness. These are hard when your flesh just wants to go, oh, I'm done or I want it my way. Mm-hmm. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. That's what he means. It's hard. You'll be rejected by people. You'll be mocked by people. You'll be yep. misunderstood by people for the way you walk with Christ. I mean, God offers us life transformation, and it's awesome. It's wonderful. Amen. But it's going to come at a cost. Because Jesus himself said to the crowd, calculate the cost That's right. of what it means to follow me because mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to pick up your cross every day. And lay come down after your me. life. Lay, and meaning lay down your life. Lay down your own feelings that go against the character of Christ. That's what we're all here to learn. How to be more like him. This yeah. is the purpose of our life. It isn't just about feeling good with one another because we have to be iron sharpening iron. Right. And we have to help one another even sometimes with our blind spots because we all have them. And so when a friend in Christ comes and wants to sit down and talk with you and say, I think this is what you're doing. It's like it's, it's destructive. I see destruction. If we just say, hey, look, you know, I have my own way and I don't need to listen to you. That's not how we grow up spiritually. God put the body of Christ together and anointed the body of Christ so that we could love one another and, like you said, spur one another on to love and good deeds. We need each other for yes. that. We are not each other's enemy no. when we try to help one another understand these things. But it's hard, isn't it? Because we want to go, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> don't tell me that. It hurts. It makes me feel bad. I feel rejected. And we go through all these feelings 
but we have to judge them against who we are in Christ. Yes. It's like, yes, I might feel rejected, but if I don't have anything else, if I take off rejection, I have to put on acceptance of Christ. Then, I, then my feelings start to die down. Right. Because I think, well, if God's for me, who can be against me? This person is actually yes. helping me to grow spiritually. So important. But we will suffer in the flesh. Come on. I mean, Christ has said suffered in the flesh, so we will suffer the same way. So we have to just look at it like that and go, this is not unusual. I'm not being persecuted. Come on. It's not unusual. We might be persecuted soon in this country. <laughs> Real well, persecution. Yep. Matthew 24, we we did a whole study about that. It says the whole world will hate us because of his name. You know, right now it's like being unfriended on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have brothers and sisters around the world that are being murdered, yeah. tortured. And all we think, oh, we're being misunderstood. And then we make such a big deal out of it. Come on, guys. Yeah. It's like... We have to consider how forgiven we've been by Christ. How much mercy we've each been shown by Jesus. That's right. How much love and acceptance and willing to go that extra mile with somebody mm -hmm. to help them instead of just, look, the cancel culture is the spirit of Antichrist. <laughs> yeah, it is. And here's the key. It's like Matthew 24. I I'm just go right back to it. He says, because of lawlessness, people's love will grow cold. Yeah. It's going to grow cold. And he's talking to the church. He's not talking yeah. to unbelievers. The love will grow cold. That can't be us, guys. But we've got to understand, persecution comes with the territory. We're not of this world. We don't belong to this world. We'll inherit the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That's what they're all fighting for. Yeah. All we have to do is follow Christ, and then he's going to make it all brand new, and then we'll get it. That's going to be glorious yeah. in itself. Amen. But here's what he says. Again, he Paul's writing to the Corinthian church here. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. This is really important. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Yeah. Do you know what kept a lot of people out of the promised land? Well, a whole generation. Murmuring and complaining. Yeah. No. How were you with this murmuring and complaining. All you have to do is read the paper or read the headlines. What's the first thing that comes out of your mouth? Do you need a book on murmuring and complaining? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Let me read it cover to cover. This is that's our last scripture, so we're just gonna we're gonna begin to close out here. We're, we're really encouraging you to understand what spiritual maturity is. I want to encourage you to understand that we have a part to play. There's always a God part. He always does his part. But there's a man part. That means you and I have a part to play. If we don't do our part, God is under no obligation to do his part to you. Because we receive the promises through faith and patience. And it takes a while to start to work on your character. And what we have to do is open our heart to the things of God. And when we open our heart to the things of God, we become the clay. Remember that scripture? He's the potter, we're the clay. We're not going to tell him that we think he's doing things wrong. What we need to do is humble ourselves come to the place where we recognize we're the created beings he's God he created us and we really desire we want godly relationships we want spiritually healthy relationships and the church should be a, a 
shining light for it. You're my brothers. You're my sisters. And what we have to do is work together to, not so that I'm right, not so that you're right. It's so that God is right. And that's what we agree on. So let's just bow our heads as we close out. Let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart, speak to you. I think it's a great reminder that we, that we remember this life is not yes. all that there is. Come on. That there's an eternity out ahead of us. And we're going to take our character and our love for God and what we did in love and kindness and the fruit of the Spirit to love and serve other people. That's what will be rewarded. Just those little choices to pursue the love of God. And so let's just pray. I just want to pray a general prayer because I think we can all come from this viewpoint. That, Lord, it's hard. It's hard to look at ourselves. It's hard to look at myself, deal honestly with my flesh. But, Lord, we don't want to make excuses. Right. You say the gate is narrow. The path is narrow. Lord, help us to walk it out in this life, not in our own strength. Mm -hmm. God, we thank you that you are merciful to us. You are kind to us. You give us all the grace that we need to help us to change. Help me, Father. Help us, Lord, as a people to see our fleshly ways and to put them behind us. Yes. To be done with childish things. Admit when we're wrong. Ask for help. Ask for forgiveness. But we need to ask the person we've hurt for forgiveness. God, we want to change. We want to be more like you. Help us, Holy Spirit. We worship you, Lord. church all your life and never surrendered your heart to Jesus, never made him Lord over your life. And you say, well, I can say, you want to do that today. I would encourage you to do that yes. today. It takes just a step of faith. Salvation is a gift that we're given. You cannot earn salvation. You cannot do enough good works to be worthy of heaven. Only Jesus made us worthy. He made us worthy by his blood that he shed on the cross. That's how he paid the penalty for your sin and my sin. And so if you realize, you know what, I, I never put faith in that. I might have seen the cross, but I never understood the cross. And so if that's you this morning, and you say, you know, I, I actually want to give my life to Christ this morning, you could just raise your hand. Nobody's looking around. All it is is an act of faith towards God. You say, I want to give my life to you this morning. Is there anybody in here? hope and our prayer for you today is that whether it be through the, the message you just heard through the worship this morning or simply serving and connecting with other believers that you and your family have been encouraged to take another step closer to walking with Jesus today. I want to uh, remind you that if you're a first time guest and you want to drop off the guest card in the back or also if you have an offering to drop off in the box back there, don't forget to do that. I also want to remind you that our prayer partners are over here. They're ready to pray with you and they want to pray with you. If there's anything you need in your life, maybe you're uh, having a, a situation with, with a job, you're, you need help, uh, you just need God's help to find a job, to find a, a work. Maybe it's a, an emotional situation or a relationship that, that needs healing. Whatever it may be, if you want somebody to agree with you in prayer, our prayer partners are over here and they want to pray with you, so make sure you go take advantage of that. Uh, we just want to encourage you all to stay connected with one another this week because we are stronger together. Amen? So thank you all for coming. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching online. Um, hope you all have a wonderful week. Be blessed. You're dismissed. <laughs>